Two years ago, The Last of Us Part 2 was released. This was my most anticipated game ever. You see, The Last of Us Part 1 is my favorite game. It's my favorite story, and it means so much to me. So words cannot describe how much I was looking forward to playing The Last of Us Part 2. And when I finally got to play it, I hated it. I hated it so much that I didn't even finish it. I made it a little bit over halfway before I sat my controller down and decided I was done. I'm not going to finish it. So I watched Jack Septicai finish the game, and I listened to what he had to say about it, and what Moist Critical, Luke Stevens, Marcus from Cosmonaut Variety Hour, Dunkey, what all these creators were saying about this game, and I kind of formed my opinion around that. I decided that I did not like The Last of Us Part II, and nothing could change my mind. But I couldn't stop thinking about it. For the last two years, every once in a while, I start thinking about the game again, and just wondering why? Why after all this time did they want to release something that they knew was going to divide the fan base so hard? Well, I must not be the only person who can't stop thinking about this game, because I started seeing videos pop up that are made very recently. I don't know if it's because of the HBO series that's being made, or the fact that we have a Last of Us Part 1 remake right around the corner. Whatever it may be, there's still content being made about The Last of Us Part 2, and a lot of it seems to be actually positive. So a couple weeks ago, I decided, you know what? I'm gonna finish The Last of Us Part 2. I installed it on my PlayStation 5, and I started from the beginning. But, this time with a goal. See, I knew how the story was gonna play out. I knew all the plot points, all the twists, everything that was going to happen. So I can let go of my bias towards the game, any personal feelings, and play the game as it was intended by the developers. So without further ado, this is Understanding The Last of Us Part Two. Now right away, Joel catches us up to exactly where we are. He's explaining everything that happened with the fireflies to his brother Tommy. And while doing so, he's cleaning a guitar. This guitar is going to become something very, very important through the entire playthrough of The Last of Us Part 2. This guitar acts as an anchor to Joel and the memories we have with Joel and the character of Joel. Because very early on in the game, Joel gets taken away from us by a character named Abby. And at this point, we don't know much about her. We get to play as Abby for just a little bit before she brutally murders Joel in front of Ellie and us. Now this was one of my first big issues. I knew that Joel was going to die in this game. From the trailers, it almost seemed impossible that he wasn't going to. But I did not expect it to be so soon. And not only that, I didn't expect it to be so unsatisfying. See, Joel is a character that we got to grow with and love. A character that we got to experience the world through. A character that we got to experience loss through. A character that we got to experience love through. And then he's just taken away from us. And that's it. No hero's death for Joel. But in the world of The Last of Us, and our world, we don't get to choose how our loved ones die. It's something that happens and something that's unexpected, something that leaves us either sad, angry, confused, or all of the above. And that is exactly what Naughty Dog gave us. We are Ellie in this moment. After this, I guarantee everybody was on board with hunting down Abby and killing her. That was the one goal we had. That was the one thing we wanted to do. See, just before this moment, we play as Ellie four years after The Last of Us Part 1. And it's obvious that her and Joel have a falling out. And they're not speaking. And we want to know why. And we want to fix it. We want, we want these two to be back to the way they were. But that gets taken away from Ellie and from us. Over the course of Ellie's section of the game, we learn a little bit more about what happened between her and Joel especially through flashbacks. So now that we're all good and filled with hate and revenge, 
we start our journey in Seattle. And over the next three days, we get to truly see Ellie completely lose herself. The Ellie that we grew to love in The Last of Us Part 1 is nearly completely gone in Part 2. You see, the Ellie of the first game is a character that we can connect with, someone with such a bright personality. She loved comic books and asking Joel questions and a girl who we learned wanted to be an astronaut when she grew up. But the Ellie now is someone who operates solely off of rage and hate and regret. Somebody who is obsessed with the idea of getting vengeance. Somebody who starts to do things that they normally wouldn't just to get their way. I first started to notice this when we were exploring Seattle with Dina. And Dina is almost like the Ellie character of the first game. Where she has these lines of dialogue that have to do with the world around them and she's asking questions and she's the one that's making jokes. She's the light in all the darkness. And Ellie is almost like the Joel that we first knew. Someone who is grizzled from surviving in such a dark and cruel world. But we sort of connect to Ellie because we feel the same way. You know, we are the ones who have gone through these experiences and we're so used to the world of The Last of Us now. We're on board with killing everybody and anybody who gets in our way. We want revenge just as much as Ellie does. So after you spend your first day murdering and almost dying and more murdering and more almost dying, you make it to a theater where you get to bunker down for the night. And this is the part where Ellie reveals to Dina that she's immune to this virus and Dina reveals to Ellie that she's been pregnant this whole time. Which there were clues there if you were paying attention. But I thought this was going to be a bigger moment. This is Ellie's biggest secret that she's revealing. It's kind of just brushed off to the side and not really mentioned again. Like it's definitely a plot point but it's not as big of a plot point as I thought it was going to be. At this point it just kind of feels like everything is falling apart around you. But this leads to one of the best moments in the whole game. You explore the theater a little bit, and once you get to a back room, you find a guitar. And we get this awesome scene where Ellie plays Future Days, which is her and Joel's song. This is the song that embodies Joel's and Ellie's relationship. Back in The Last of Us Part 1, Joel made a promise to Ellie that he was going to sing to her. And this is the song that he finally does sing to her. And it's a little reminder of what was taken away from us. It's a reminder as to why we're doing this, and it's immediately followed up with this brilliant flashback of Joel taking Ellie to a museum for her birthday. And it's this beautiful segment, it takes you out of this dark world that The Last of Us 2 built, and it kind of puts you back into the, the nostalgic feeling of The Last of Us Part 1, where you get to play as little kid Ellie and have all these conversations with Joel about what's in the museum, about the dinosaurs and the spaceships, and this is where we learn that Ellie wanted to be an astronaut. And this is everything I wanted The Last of Us Part Two to be. I wanted more of this, but this is the little tiny segment, the little light in the darkness that we get to remind us of our goal and why we're doing all this. This scene is so touching that even on this second playthrough, I still teared up to it. It just, it reminds you how much these characters mean to us. But it's short-lived and we're thrown back into the world of The Last of Us Part 2. And we're back on our mission to hunt and kill Abby. This is really the turning point for Ellie. From here on out, everything just spirals downhill. She goes out searching for Tommy in the hopes of bringing him back with her. Instead, she runs into Jesse and her and Jesse make their way back to the theater. 
These are two people that Ellie has for her right now. These are two friends that are willing to help her no matter the cost. These are the two closest things that she has to a family right now. But she's so obsessed with the idea of Abby that she's too blind to see it. And she goes off on her own in the search for Nora at the hospital. This is where we see Ellie start to become this savage who will go to any length for her revenge. She will do anything to find Abby. That is all she cares about. And it's really apparent when we finally do meet up with Nora and there's this chase that leads to these spores and Nora realizes that Ellie's the girl. She's the one. She's the reason for all of this. Ellie finds out that Joel killing all the fireflies is the reason that they came and killed Joel in the first place. Ellie proceeds to torture Nora to figure out where Abby is. I think the first time I played this game, I didn't really think much of this part. I kind of thought it was kind of badass. But definitely during the second playthrough, I start to realize that this obsession that Ellie has is really taking a toll. And this scene's followed up by her standing outside of the theater shaking because of the things that she's done and she's covered in Nora's blood and she has a bit of a breakdown. This mission she's on, you have to ask yourself if it's really worth it. And I think that's exactly what Naughty Dog wanted from us. They wanted us to question if this journey's worth it. If Ellie losing every part of herself for this is actually worth all the trouble, all the lives that we're gonna take. So now we're at day three. Jesse learns that Dean is pregnant and wants to take her home. He wants him and Ellie to take Dina back to Jackson so that Dina can be safe and have this baby. But first, they have to rescue Tommy. And at this point, I'm not super on board, and neither is Ellie. Jesse and Dina can easily go back to Jackson without her, and she can finish this mission saving Tommy. But Jesse cares about Tommy and Joel as well, and he wants to help rescue Tommy and bring him back. The plan going forward is they're gonna go find Tommy, reunite, and then the four of them are gonna go back to Jackson. And this doesn't really sit right with Ellie. It's obvious. She's saying, yeah, that's the plan because these are her friends and she cares about them. And she's so traumatized from the previous night that, you know, maybe this is the best thing to do. And maybe it is, but at the same time, we set out on this mission with a very specific goal. We need to find Abby, and this is something that will eat at Ellie for the rest of her life if she doesn't finish this. And I believe that the player should probably feel the same way. You know, we're a little bit torn. Yes, we want Ellie and all these characters to be safe and to be able to have a good life, but we also want our revenge as well. So we get to a point where we learn about Tommy's whereabouts and we learn about Abby's possible whereabouts. So Ellie and Jesse go their separate ways. Ellie chooses her obsession over her friends. As Ellie, we go to the aquarium thinking Abby's gonna be there. Instead, we find Mel and Owen. We don't have the context, but clearly something's wrong. Abby isn't around and Mel and Owen are kind of arguing and that isn't a concern of Ellie. Ellie wants Abby. So Ellie holds them at gunpoint and proceeds to interrogate them, like we've seen Joel do in the past. Back in The Last of Us Part 1 where Joel's trying to find Ellie, Ellie's using the same tactics here, but to less success than we saw with Joel. This leads to us as Ellie killing Owen and killing Mel, who we find out is pregnant, just like Dina. And this is where Ellie completely loses it. She has stooped to a level so low that she has a nervous breakdown. And Tommy and Jesse are there for her and they take her back to the theater. It's time to call it quits. It's time to go back to Jackson and put all this behind us. And Ellie for a second agrees that this is the play. Even though we know that Ellie won't be happy until she gets her revenge, at this point in time, this seems like the only option. At this point in time, 
Ellie's okay with the idea of letting Abby go and making sure that her friends are safe. We're packing our bags and we're ready to just put this behind us. That is until Abby shows up and blasts this dude in the face and knocks this dude out and we're pumped, we're ready. This is what we've been waiting for, it's time. After eight to 10 hours, it's all coming down to this. Ellie versus Abby, finally. And then, wait a minute, why are we playing as Abby now? Oh, okay, I get it, Naughty Dog. You're gonna show me that Abby lost her dad and he's a super cool guy, he's perfect. <laughs> all right, cool. Let's play as Ellie. I'm still gonna kill her. N nope. Okay, we're still playing as Abby. No. Uh, no. When's this gonna end? Let's let's play as Ellie now. Oh, we're still playing as Abby. I okay. I get it, Naughty Dog. I get it, Naughty Dog. Seriously, let me play as Ellie. All right. So yes, for the next eight or ten hours, you're gonna play as Abby. On my first playthrough, this is where I stopped. I think I played through day one as Abby and realized this was it. And I couldn't connect myself to it. The pacing just came to a dead halt and I couldn't get past it. But seeing as I knew this part was coming up this time, what I chose to do was take a day off. I didn't play the game for a day, I just thought about everything that I experienced as Ellie and thought about what I was getting into as Abby. So I sat down and it was almost as if I was starting a new game. You play as Abby and you connect with her father and you know what? He's a cool guy. All right, maybe he's a little too perfect. Naughty Dog is really uh, tongue in cheek there. They think that they're pulling one over on us, but we're smarter than them. And you know, even the second time through, yeah, I don't, I sympathize with Abby. I'm able to at least do that. I can understand the way that she feels. I don't have the same feeling as her, but I can understand it. Abby wakes up from a nightmare of her finding her dad's dead body after she got her revenge on Joel. And, and on my first playthrough, I didn't think much of this. But on my second playthrough, I kind of realized what her nightmares were about. I didn't think that they were as important as they were, but her nightmares are telling us where Abby's at in her journey. She's still haunted by what Joel did. Her revenge didn't get her anywhere. It wasn't her hate that gets rid of her nightmares, but we'll come back to that. Day one is basically a waste of time. We find out that Owen is going rogue and that the WLF are at war with this group called the Seraphites or the Scars. We're forced to go on a mission with Mel and Manny to try and connect with these characters a little bit. I don't think it works. Honestly, if day one was a lot shorter or if they just cut to the chase a little bit, the pacing wouldn't be as bad as it was. But Abby's story actually starts to ramp up once you run into Lev and Yara. These two characters are the best part of this game. The WLF and the Scars hate each other and kill each other on sight. But for some reason, Abby decides to save Yara, and Yara and Lev decide to save Abby. Yara's arm is badly hurt, so they find shelter, and Abby leaves Lev and Yara there, and she continues to go find Owen. She finds Owen at the aquarium, and this is where she confronts him. Owen is accused of killing Danny to save a Seraphite. Abby doesn't believe that that's what happened. But Owen explains to her that he refused to kill an old Seraphite who could barely defend himself and Danny was going to kill him anyway and they got in a fight and at the end he ended up accidentally killing Danny. Although I don't like Owen as a character, this is a very important part. He starts to point a finger at Abby and the player. Owen stands on the side of sympathy and compassion and understanding while Abby is on the side of anger and revenge and hate. There's this back and forth between them and he's he's telling her, look, we are lost. This isn't who we are. This isn't what we signed up for. How did we get to this point in our lives? And then it's immediately followed up with 
that scene. Even the second time, I don't still fully understand why we had to have this in the game. The point still comes across clearly without it, but I'll roll with it. I don't really care. This leads into another nightmare that Abby has. Except this time when she walks into the hospital room, it's not her dad that she sees. She sees Yara and Lev. This is a calling. This is her realizing that I have to do something about these kids. I have to help them in some way. And finally, after all this time, I'm starting to actually connect with Abby's mission. So we set out and we go find Yara and Lev and realize that Yara is going to die if she doesn't get help. So we take Yara and Lev back to the aquarium. Luckily, Mel is there too. And she tells her that she has to cut off her arm and all the tools that I need are at the hospital. In order to get there in time, Lev leads Abby to the hospital using Seraphite paths. We get to spend time with Lev and see how his views of the world differ from Abby's and we get to see these two start to bond and connect and it's very reminiscent of Joel and Ellie from the first game and it's kind of on the nose to be honest I wasn't really sold Naughty Dog really likes to spoon feed us their themes and we get to the sky bridge scene where we learn that Abby is afraid of heights and they have to go across this rickety bridge between two buildings and it seems like at this point Naughty Dog really wants us to care about Abby and they want to use this scene to make us realize that we kind of care about Abby. Now for some people this might actually work. For me not so much. I still don't really connect to the Abby character just yet. I can still somewhat see how I'm supposed to relate to her without actually feeling like I relate to her. But I think what the scene really did for me was make me realize that I should start to sympathize with Abby. That I should actively try my best to understand and try to relate to her. To let go of my anger towards her for something that she did to Ellie and just live in the moment now and start to form a relationship with these two characters. So that's what I did going forward. On their journey, Lev and Abby come across Seraphites and they have to fight their way out. And this is where we hear the Seraphites call Lev Lily. And it kind of starts to click for us what is going on with Lev and Yara and why they're no longer a part of the Seraphites. They still hold on to their Seraphite beliefs, but they're not a part of this cult that is starting to form. Lev asks Abby if she heard what they called her, and she says yeah. And Lev asks her if she wants to ask him about it. And Abby says, do you want me to ask you about it? And I thought this was just a nice little moment. It really starts to make Lev a more dynamic character and kind of separate him from Ellie, not make him such an Ellie ripoff or an Ellie clone. And this really is just the start to this Abby-Lev bond that starts to form. And I, I actually really like that. They have this dynamic between them where they view the world in two different ways. Lev prays to the prophet and Abby kind of has a snide remark towards that. And Lev asks her, well, have you ever read anything from the prophet? And Abby says no. And it just kind of shows that there are two different sides to this. And, you know, Abby doesn't quite understand Lev's point of views yet. And Lev doesn't really understand Abby's. And it's kind of this tongue-in-cheek way to make us realize that Abby and Ellie also... So after fighting through hordes of infected and seraphites, you finally make it to the hospital and Lev and Abby kind of have to split up for this. Abby goes on to the hospital and she's talking to all the other WLF members, you know, all these NPCs interacting with them. And it's kind of funny because if you played this game anything like I did, you had previously gone through this area as Ellie and just massacred all these guys. Kind of just like a funny little moment to point out. 
but you meet up with Nora and she tells you that the tools and the medicine that you're going to need is in the lower levels of the hospital, which haven't been explored yet. These are day one infected down here, that it's too difficult for them to clear these rooms out, so a lot of the stuff has been left untouched. Now, this is one of my favorite parts of this game, because the horror side of this game just ramps up and it takes you out of this misery simulator that we've been playing through this whole time and we get to forget about all the BS that we've been going through and just focus on this. It leads to this really cool enemy that we are introduced to called the Rat King which essentially is just a bunch of day one infected all mangled up into this ball. I don't think I've ever felt so tense playing this game. This was a nice moment and I wish there was more like this. This journey really got me to actually care about the character of Lev. And you and Lev make it back to the aquarium to help save Yara. Now all of this could feel like a really long side quest that isn't important to the main story, but this is Abby's story. Abby and Ellie are on two different paths. Ellie is on the path of revenge and hate, and Abby is on the, the path of empathy and love, and learning how to care about these two people that she's been taught to think are the worst people in the world. Now you could just not care about any of this stuff and really want to get back to Ellie so that you can kill Abby, or you can kind of sit back and try to put yourself into Abby's shoes and just enjoy the story that you're playing right now. Which is what I was able to do and I think it made the experience a lot better. Actually learning how to care about new characters such as Lev and Yara really made me not hate the fact that I was playing as Abby during this section. Now I said I was going to come back to this. You see at this point in time Abby no longer thinks about what Joel did to her father. She has put it behind her. She's got something else to put her focus into. Someone else to put her focus into. She has moved on. She's finally overcome her hatred. It gets to a point where Lev has left the group to go back to the Seraphi Island to try and convince their mother to come with them. And we know that Lev's mother probably isn't going to change their mind. And we also know that the WLF are going to launch a siege on the Seraphi Island. And at this point, I really realized that I cared about Lev because I wanted to go there and rescue them. Which is exactly what we do. Abby and Yara get on the boat and they travel to the Seraphi Island to rescue Lev and get out of there. To meet back up with Owen and Mel, get on his boat, and sail away. But we know how that ends. The island sequence was actually really cool. At first I wasn't certain. To me this is a very good climactic section for Abby's story. and. I'm all on board with Abby's mission and I'm all for it. I want to rescue Lev and get out of here and leave the WLF behind. Unfortunately after you guys rescue Lev, Isaac and some WLF members kill Yara in front of you and they're about to kill Lev. And then we get this really Jedi moment from Abby where she stands between Lev and Isaac and says that if you want him, you're gonna have to kill me too. This is like one of the first times that I really start to respect Abby. I feel for her in this connection that she has to Lev. I'm starting to care. I'm actually starting to care. For the first time I really felt like I wasn't focused so much on Ellie's side of the story. I was completely sucked into the Abby side of the story. But it's short lived because immediately after this you go back to the aquarium and you remember what you had previously done as Ellie. Abby finds Mel and Owen's dead bodies and unfortunately Ellie left behind their map that leads them directly to the theater which as we know Abby follows and this is where the two stories meet up once again.
we finally reached the big climactic part of this game and were forced to play as Abby and fight Ellie to the death. We don't want to do that. No part of us wants to fight Ellie. Most people would probably just set the controller down and let Abby's character die and then be done with it. I couldn't understand why. Why is this where they wanted to take this game? Because if we played as Ellie, we were just going to do everything we could to kill Abby. That's That was our mission, that was our goal. If we play as Abby, we're not going to want to kill Ellie because we care too much about her. So why is this where they took us? And I listened to a lot of interviews with Neil Druckmann on the choices that they made for this game. Everything was very deliberate. They had testing, they had the information they needed when making this game. They knew that once we play as Abby, a majority of the players were going to stop playing. It was almost like they were testing the player to see if they can overcome their hate and, and let go of their feelings for Abby to actually play through this and try to sympathize and understand. Because at the end of the day, this isn't a revenge story. It's a story of forgiveness and sympathy and understanding. Now, I saw a really cool suggestion that they could have had this be the final interaction with Ellie and Abby where you start the fight as Abby and you kind of reluctant, you don't want to, but Ellie starts to get the upper hand because realistically, Ellie should have won this fight. She has all these weapons and tools at her disposal. And once she starts to get the upper hand, the perspective switches to Ellie and you finish the fight as Ellie. And I think that would have been really cool, but that isn't what we got. Instead, Abby lays the absolute hammer down on Dina and Ellie and gives them the beating of a lifetime. And she's fully prepared to kill Dina. Ellie yells to her that she's pregnant and she's so filled with her hate that she says good and she's about to kill her when Lev tells her to stop. And you finally see the progression of Abby's character. She doesn't let the revenge take over. She knows that it isn't going to fix anything. So she chooses the path of love and forgiveness and she lets them live once again. Once again, we're playing as Ellie and we're living on a farm with Dina and her new baby. They're trying their best to live a normal life. You get to spend a few minutes interacting with the family and doing some mundane tasks when you get hit with a flash of what happened to Joel and it becomes apparent that Ellie is still suffering from the trauma of Joel's passing. Come on, little guy. Do you wanna eat? She hasn't quite gotten over it yet, and she thinks that getting revenge is the only thing that's going to stop her from having these nightmares and panic attacks. Tommy, who survived a gunshot wound to the head like an absolute tank, shows up and says that he has an idea where Abby might be hiding out. And he opens up a doorway for Ellie to pursue her path of vengeance or stay with her family. And the ultimatum is if she leaves, she leaves everything behind. She loses everything for her obsession. And this is the path that Ellie chooses. She goes searching for Abby. So we get to Santa Barbara and Ellie is searching for Abby. She's following the clues and she's on her tail. This section of the game just felt very tacked on to me. 
It didn't feel like this was something that needed to be in the game. Like, we could have settled everything in Seattle. The whole rattlers and slavery, I wasn't really sold on it. It just kind of felt like an afterthought to me. And I knew everything that was going to happen, so maybe if this was the first time I ever saw this, I would be a little more into it. But I knew where this was going, and I wanted to get there as fast as I could. So after you completely obliterate everybody in this rattler camp, you finally find Abby. She's tied up onto this post and resembles nothing of her former self. She is completely changed. She's weak and small and frail. You almost don't even believe it's her at first. You cut her down, and instead of her wanting to fight you or bring up the past, her main focus is to get to Lev and let him down. Showing just how much Abby has changed, she cuts down Lev and tells Ellie that there's a couple of boats on the shore that they can get away. She's thankful that Ellie saved her, and she's willing to let Ellie live again. It's like she would rather just put all this behind them. And this whole time, Ellie is kind of silent. She seems a little hesitant to go through with it. She's putting her bag in the boat as if she's ready to go. And then she gets hit with another flash of Joel, kind of reminding us again what our mission is and what Abby actually took from us. And this is the first time I think that Ellie and myself personally aren't on the same page. She tells Abby that she's not going to let her leave here without a fight. Abby tells her that she's over it. She doesn't want to fight, she just wants to leave. Just let us go. And Ellie holds a knife up to Lev's throat, showing us just how much Ellie has lost herself. This is the part that made me really upset with Ellie. See, if you got to this section and you didn't care if Ellie kills Lev, then this story just didn't work for you. And that's okay, because not every story is going to. Maybe this game just doesn't do it for you. For me, I felt like it did. I felt something inside when Ellie held the knife up to Lev's throat, and I was actually upset. And that leads to the most miserable fight I've ever seen. Ellie and Abby have this brutal fight that's hard to watch. It's silent, and it's just these two hitting each other and shoving each other into the water, and Ellie gets her fingers bitten off, and Abby gets sliced and stabbed, and, and it just drags on and on and on, and it's miserable, and I don't want it to happen. I just want these two to go their separate directions. I want Abby to be able to take care of Lev, and I want Ellie to be able to move on and live her life and not throw everything away. And then Ellie gets the upper hand on Abby. She has her face down under the water. She's going to drown her. After all this time, she's finally going to get her revenge. It's a very heavy and emotional scene. And I remember thinking that I don't want her to kill Abby. After all this time, I actually don't want her to kill Abby. And she gets a flash of Joel on a porch with his guitar. Not a flash of Joel dying, a flash of Joel at a separate point in time that we haven't seen yet. She lets Abby up and tells her to go. Take Lev and get out of here. And she's in tears and Abby leaves. She takes Lev and she leaves. And Ellie's sitting there in the water and she is all by herself. Ellie goes back to the farm where Dina has packed everything up and taken the baby and left Ellie with, with her guitar and her belongings. You get this heartbreaking scene of Ellie trying to play her and Joel's song on the guitar. She's missing her fingers and this symbolizes what she's lost on her path of revenge. She's lost a part of herself. She lost everybody she loved. She's truly alone at the end of this story, which we know is her biggest fear is ending alone. And then we get a heartbreaking scene of Joel on his porch with his guitar. Ellie and Joel are still having their problems and Ellie comes up to him. They start to have this awkward little encounter where they're trying to have a conversation. Ellie lays it all out. She tells Joel exactly how she feels. That it wasn't Joel's choice, it was Ellie's choice whether she were to die or not. Whether she were to serve this purpose to help make a cure or not. 
it's not up to Joel to defend her when she can fight her own fights and it's this brutal emotional breakdown that she has Joel tells her that if he could do it all again he would and I agree I would too knowing how this ends I would do it over and over and over that is the love that these characters have for each other and the love I have for these characters Ellie tells him that she doesn't know she's going to be able to forgive him for what he did, but she wants to try. More than anything, she wants to try to work on forgiving Joel for what he did and having things go back to the way they were. And we know that this was the night before Joel's life is taken, before us to be able to forgive Joel gets taken away. But I believe that Ellie thinking about this in her moment of nearly killing Abby is her forgiving Joel. Maybe she doesn't forgive Abby for what she did, but she lets Abby live. And that's her telling us that she forgave Joel and that she's ready to move on with her life. That's why I think that she didn't kill Abby. She puts the guitar down and she walks away. Through the window, we see her moving on. I believe where Ellie's story ends is where Abby's story started. She's ready to move on. She's ready to focus on love instead of hate. If we get a Last of Us Part 3, I hope they really explore this. I hope they do Ellie's story justice, and we get to come full circle with the story arc, and we get to finally see Ellie be happy. So after all of it, do I like The Last of Us Part 2? Well, the answer is not that easy. I don't think I hate it. I don't hate it nearly as much as I did when I first tried to play through it. But I don't think I liked it either. I don't think that I want to play through this story again. It's it's miserable and it's depressing and it's the story that Naughty Dog wanted to tell, but it's not the story that I wanted. I wanted something completely different, but we don't get what we want. And I hope that they do make a Last of Us Part 3, but all in all, I do believe that it is a good game. It has a lot of issues, but finally, I think I fully understand The Last of Us Part 2. Thank you guys for watching. I don't usually close my videos out this way, but this video took a long time to make and it was really important to me. I started this video months ago, back before The Last of Us Part 1 remake was even out, and I had to go back and re-record some parts because I wasn't happy with how it ended up. But really, thank you for watching, and if you liked it, please like it, and consider subscribing. It would mean a lot to me. See you guys.